The Western Interior Seaway is a vast shallow sea that splits North America down the middle during the Late Cretaceous. It is an environment of monstrous reptiles. Pterosaurs fly over the waves in their thousands. Toothed birds cluster the shores. Long-necked plesiosaurs snare up the countless fish species. And enormous mosasaurs feed on anything smaller than themselves even each other. Always present are the sharks, from medium-sized scavengers like Squillacorax to the much larger Crotoxyrhina, generalist predators that fill roles similar to many modern sharks. But just like today, some species became more specialized in their diet. One of the most common families you'll see around the world during the Mesozoic are Ammonites. Cephalopods that, unlike octopuses and squid, have a protective shell encasing them. There are many species coming in different sizes, having different shells, and feeding on different prey. Many are filter feeders, while others prefer larger meals. Despite their impressive defenses, they are prey to animals that have the sheer strength to crack their shells, or have the equipment to bypass such armor. One of the best equipped of all is a shark family. Tychotis. On the outside, they look much like any other shark, but it's their teeth that make all the difference. Instead of being thin and sharp, their teeth are thick, grooved, and multi-layered, built to crush, not cut. There are over a dozen species, and like their prey, they have spread out across the globe. Here in the Western Interior Seaway, a few species patrol the waterways, there's more than enough hard-shelled invertebrates to support them all. By the coastlines under the midday sun, reefs flourish with life, and bobbing up and down in the current, sticking their tentacles out of their shells are countless ammonites. Most fish ignore them, but where there are ammonites, there will eventually be one or more tychotis. Gliding over the reef with the ease and grace all sharks possess, a fully grown individual casually moves towards her prey. Many of the small fish and even juvenile marine reptiles give her a wide berth, but do not scatter in fear. Most know that the 7 meter predator does not see them as prey, and is simply passing through. But it is hard to fight one's instinct to hide when faced with any species of shark. The Tychotis moves up from the reef into the mass of ammonites, searching for the perfect catch. She is spawn of choice. There are multiple species just in this section of reef. So she is going for her preferred meals. Once she has picked out a target from the mass of spiral shells, she opens her jaws and sucks in water rapidly, pulling the armored cephalopod into her jaws, expelling the water out of her gills. Now with a good grip, she chomps down on the shell over and over again cracking and then puncturing her prey's defenses, sending small fragments of armor into the clear water. Eventually, her thick teeth pulverize the ammonite shell, and the soft body beneath is exposed. Hungrily, she swallows her meal, taking a small amount of the shell down as well. Her digestive system can handle this, though like some modern sharks, she can expel her entire stomach if there is enough that is actively inhibiting her. She clamps her jaws around another one. This ammonite doesn't withdraw into its biological bunger, however. It attacks with tentacles wrapping around the shark's nose, but his soft appendages do basically nothing, and after a few bites from the Tychotis, he too becomes shattered and consumed. As the predator sates her hunger, she drifts further out from the reef and sees another species of ammonite, one large even for her. At two meters in diameter, their armor is almost impenetrable. Even large mosasaurs like Prognaphodon that also go after hard shell prey often don't bother with ammonites of this size. One of the giant's long tentacles lash out and catch a small fish that got too close, and pulls it back into its shell to consume in safety. The Tychotis swims between the large floating spirals, content with feeding on their smaller counterparts. Rushing in from deeper waters comes a duo of panicked Styxosaurus, swimming as fast as they can to get to shallower waters and escape the jaws of a pursuing Tylosaurus. 
The 14 meter lizard is faster than the long necked Styxosaurus, but is too far away and gives up the chase, not wanting to waste any more energy. His path does, however, bring him close to the female Tychotis, and upon seeing her, the massive marine reptile goes for a new target. Recognizing the threat, the Tychotis does the same as the Styxosaurus and aims for the reef, but may not have time to get there. She swims under one of the massive ammonites and barges through multiple of the smaller ones, sending them spiraling in her wake. The Tylosaurus also crashes through the swarm of invertebrates. Dozens bounce off his hide. But then one of the large ones shoots out its tentacles and latches onto the long reptile's tail. Curious as to why it was suddenly harder to swim, the Tylosaurus looked over his shoulder and saw the massive cephalopod had unexpectedly latched onto him. Immediately, he twisted his long body around and bit into some of the tentacles ensnaring him. Having not realized the size of the animal the ammonite had attacked, the invertebrate retreated into its shell, losing multiple tentacles as a result. Now angry, the Tylosaurus knocked the hard shell aside with its snout and swallowed the torn appendages. With that distraction, the Tychotis had made it to the safety of the reef, where the Tylosaurus was too large to follow. She was still hungry, but there were plenty of other hard-shelled prey like clams and vivals she could feed on as well. Ammonites were just her preferred prey, as they floated freely in the open and didn't require prying off a surface to get at. She'd be cracking open a few more shells before the day was done. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the shell-crushing shark of the Cretaceous. Tychotis. The first remains of Tychotis were discovered in England and Germany during the first half of the 18th century, and consisted of teeth. Now as many of you know, shark skeletons are comprised of cartilage, not bone, and so don't fossilize easily, meaning many extinct sharks are known mostly or entirely from teeth. These teeth were originally thought to be the palates of porcupine fish or close relatives. As time went on, more and more of these teeth were found across Europe. Then in the early 19th century, Swiss paleontologist Louise Augustus put forward the theory that these teeth belonged to a large group that included sharks and rays. The name Tychotis was termed in 1835 and means fold tooth. The first finds in North America were discovered in 1868 by Joseph Lydie in Kansas. Many Tychotis remains would be discovered in this region, as this was part of the Western Interior Seaway, known for its excellently preserved marine remains. As the centuries went on, Tychotis remains from teeth to vertebra, and even a full skeleton have been found across the globe, from the US to the UK, Germany, Israel, Jordan, India, Japan, Mexico, and Brazil. With near global coverage, Tychotis was clearly a successful genus and over 27 different species have been named, though about 16 are still considered valid. They have been known to be cartilaginous fish for a long time. No one was certain what group they belonged to, but we'll clear that up later. All these species lived during the late Cretaceous, between 105 and 75 million years ago. Let's take a closer look at the teeth. Overall, they are quite thick and round, with wave-like patterns on them and internally have three different layers of enamel, meant to stop breaks from spreading through the entire tooth. Like modern sharks, these would have been shed and replaced constantly throughout the animal's life, which explains how we have so many of their teeth. The teeth themselves varied between each species in terms of size, space, and structure, with some, for instance, being more raised than others. They weren't kept in a single row, but laid out almost like tiles across a floor, spreading down the jaw, having up to 550 teeth for some species. So as long as a prey item fit in the jaws, it would have been crushed across a wide surface, not just a single line. Round crushing teeth are clear indicators that Tychotis had a durophagus diet, which means it mostly ate hard-shelled prey. While originally thought to have gone after prey on the bottom of the ocean, or those that hid in sediment like mollusks and bivalves, now it's believed that this genus went after prey that swam freely. 
such as the countless species of ammonites and even sea turtles. Of course, having such teeth doesn't mean Tychotis was restricted only to a durophagus diet. Judging by the range of tooth morphs, some species may have been more generalists, while others were more specialised. It's not like a hungry Tychotis would see an unattended carcass of a large animal and just turn its nose up at it. For a long time, it was thought the Tychotis genus was more closely related to the extinct hybodonts, which aren't sharks but a close relative to modern sharks. One of the key finds that helped answer a lot of questions about Tychotis was this complete skeleton found in Mexico. It even included an outline of the entire body. This amazing find cemented the theory that Tychotis wasn't related to hybodonts, but were in fact in the same group as all modern sharks. In 2024, they were found to belong to the Lamniforms, a group that includes sand sharks, megamouth sharks, basking sharks, thrasher sharks, goblin sharks, and the great white. Taking a look at the imprint, we can see that while looking very much like what you'd expect a shark to look like, the dorsal fin was further forward than normal, while the second posterior dorsal fin was much smaller, and it also had a small anal fin. The head was quite large, which may be a result of its diet, having a large powerful skull with plenty of muscle to back up its crushing teeth. Using this specimen, along with vertebra from other finds, the size of Tychotis has been estimated for some species. The full skeleton is easy enough to measure since it's complete. A few pieces of vertebra show one subadult was estimated to have gotten to between 4.3 and 7.1 meters. From there, other estimates have been given ranging from the smallest species being under 2 meters and the largest getting to over 10 meters. But that wasn't all they learned. Looking at the growth rings, it was found that this genus lived for a long time and grew fairly slowly. Not only that, but at its birth, the individual would have already been about a meter in length. So, Tychotis seemed to have had few young at a time, and carried them long enough that they were quite large upon birth. This is seen in a few modern sharks, from great whites to whale sharks. Though from the sheer size of the offspring, one has to wonder if they produce any more than one or two young at a time. A low birth rate, slow growth rate, and too specialised a diet may be among the reason for Tychotis' extinction. It has also been suggested that it may be linked to the rise of mosasaurs, especially those genera that were also specialised to feed on hard-shelled prey, like the Prognathodon genus. However, though it's commonly thought that animal families often outcompete others, it's usually not that simple and certainly doesn't explain how the Tychotis genus went extinct around the world, and more likely had to do with something affecting their food supply. With that mystery still up in the air, that's Tychotis, everyone. The bane of ammonites and all hard-to-crack ocean life. A genus that has been known from fragments for centuries, but only recently have we learned a whole lot more about this unique group of sharks. But what do you think of Tychotis? And for my question of the week, what other food sources do you think this genus would also go after when it needed to? What less unknown fish would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.